In today's episode, Alex and I dive into a Q&A with some great questions asked by you all. But before we answer those questions, only 10% of you guys that regularly watch our channel are subscribed. And we need you to subscribe so that we can continue to put out this free, easy to digest, wonderful resource that we love to do. So hit that subscribe button, share this with friends, comment below, do all of the things that help out this channel grow and to be able to put out more resources like this. We'll catch you on the inside. So we finally have a launch date for these band tees. How hype are you? Extremely, you know, since we ordered these um, <laughs> a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited for these to launch. When is the, uh, when's the launch date? July 19th. So that's coming up here soon. Yeah, just a couple weeks. Which one is your favorite? I said in the YouTube video that the purple design was my favorite. Um, so I love the purple design. I also love the blue, but I will ride this go around with the purple as last band T drop. I chose the loser shirt. <laughs> oh, explain that. <laughs> so last band T drop, uh, we had two designs. We'll call, how would you label them? Design one and design two. <laughs> <laughs> super, super helpful. Uh, uh, the physique development and the champion. Yes. Physique development, it was like a blue and, and gold look. And then there was the champion, which was like this really cool orange to yellow design with, um, what would you call on the front? A uh, It's similar to a bodybuilding trophy, but also similar to like a Nirvana mesh. Interesting. To, uh description. Um, anyway, I picked the Nirvana mesh <laughs> trophy one and that one sold less than the physique development one. And so this go around, I do not want to lose again. And I need your guys' support. <laughs> I need you all to sell out the purple design. I, I desperately cannot lose again to my wife. This is, this is humiliating. Well, I mean, it's been a, it's been a year and a half since we've ordered the new ones. It's probably been two years since the last ones launched. I have been sitting in the loser's chair for this amount of time. And I need your help to get me out of this chair and to put her in that losing <laughs> chair because she deserves it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So everyone go and buy the blue shirt. Uh, well, you got to pick first, so that's unfair. I do think that the purple might sell more because the chrome skull on the back is just sick. Yeah. The blue skull, also sick. Yeah. But I have seen just from people seeing the shirts, talking about them, that they're like the purple one. That skull is awesome. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to put a wager on this? Is there a wager that you think is fair? Well, first, I do want to talk a tiny bit more about the we're going to have the blue shirt also have the chrome skull, but we wanted it to have a little variance. Mm -hmm. So you didn't feel even if they were different colors, you're getting the exact same shirt. Now, these are the exact same shirt, like the actual T-shirt of the last band tees, because we listen to you guys and we're right there with you. This was the best quality T-shirt ever. And if you know Alex and I, quality is us mm -hmm. with synonymous if you look up quality sue and alex bush come up and vice versa wager wise uh, are you thinking of betting some like diet mountain dews or i was thinking about who is responsible for washing the dogs <laughs> for an extended period of time <laughs> well that's not fair <laughs> Because I'm Why? already the one that's responsible for washing the dog, so. But this would be a moment for you to either pawn it off on me and I'd have to handle it for X amount of time or you just keep doing your thing. And so it's really a win-win for you. It's like I'm either. win-win <laughs> if I just keep I'm either continuing them. to do what I already do or Alex has to take it and I don't have to deal with it. So win-win. Hmm. So you're you're thinking more in a chore instead of kind of like a dare or something. I mean, you have a, if you have a dare in place, let's go ahead and hear it. I don't think of dares often. Um, why don't you guys help us think of a dare? Because <laughs> I don't ever think of dares. We need help, yeah. please. What do you guys think the wager should be? And go buy the blue shirt so that I don't lose. Purple. <laughs> Getting into a Q&A today. Are you ready 
to hear some Q's and have some A's. <laughs> I believe I am ready. Can a female get her cycle back without a ton of body fat regain? We're getting right into it with the first question. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can gain your cycle back without excess body fat gain. I think that it is also important to have the conversation on what are we considering excess body fat gain? Because more often than not, the person who is trying to regain their cycle is not at a body fat level currently that they're happy with. There are times in a contest prep setting or at the end of a long dieting phase that your menstrual cycle may have been lost, that at that point you want to regain your cycle um, and you're starting from a much leaner place. But I would say more consistently, I'm having an individual who's not happy with their body composition and also is wanting to restore their menstrual function, uh, menstrual cycle function. And so with that being the case, I think that there has to be greater context of what we're believing to be excess body fat. And there is going to need to be some body fat gain, I imagine, but it does not have to be in excess. I think that uh, people overshoot of how many calories they really need to get into a restful state and to prioritize their sleep and their digestion and all these different factors. There's much more all encompassing rather than it just be eat more food and move less. And, and decrease your training and basically just be a vegetable. It's like, we can still do movement. We can still train. It's just that things are going to be adjusted to have a greater bias towards that rest and digest state to get your body into a place where it, having a menstrual cycle is a luxury function. And so your body has to have the resources and the comfort to be able to run these luxury functions. And so giving it those things is the primary focus. And part of that is going to see some fat gain, but it does not have to be in excess. Some of you might've heard him say luxury and think, I thought a menstrual cycle was just part of being a woman. But what he means by that, or what I will draw from that, is that when it comes to your menstrual cycle, everything has to be running and it has to be in a place that your body can have that cycle. And you've probably heard or just seen of a place where someone's in starvation and just different aspects of their body, or let's say someone can't get pregnant because they are too thin and their body can't support that menstrual cycle cycle. That's your body telling you, I cannot support this right now, so I'm not even going to give it an option. So when it comes to saying it's a luxury, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be normal that you have a menstrual cycle. It's just that you have to be very aware of what you're putting your body through and being able to have those variables in place to have something like your menstrual cycle. I mean, it's the, the female body is, is capable of creating life. So, I mean, you have the coolest thing that anyone could possibly do in creating a human life. So, I, I mean, I think that it, like you need to nourish your body to be able to do that. You need to take care of your body to be able to do that. Are there people who are able to have a child, able to have their menstrual cycle that do not take care of their body? Yes, that is certainly a thing. But I would say for the greater majority of people, if they're not taking care of their body, those two things are extremely hard or non-existent. I can't believe you, a male, is talking on this. I mean, why wouldn't someone just go to a female to hear about this at all? As a reference, this is a, <laughs> I think, a comment that we got from a YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> um, where I was, I was literally just encouraging for healthy hormonal function, taking care of a female's body, and it was, it, it cannot come from me. <laughs> so. He was encouraging women to make sure that they have a healthy menstrual cycle before they go into a dieting phase and got attacked for being a male saying that. So I just find it completely unbelievable that you're talking on women's reproductive systems as a male. But I digress, and I will give you a more fun question next. What is a favorite easy snack for on the go? I am not much for snacks right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am only focused on full meals at this 10 weeks into this diet. I am fully focused on just having four full meals. Now, in a more normal setting where I'm not dieting, I would say that Nash bars are my absolute favorite. 
because of the protein content as well as just the um, ingredient profile, the total calorie allotment for the, the bar itself, and it just being delicious, honestly. Uh, the double chocolate chunk is the best flavor and no one can change my opinion. And I like midday squares. Now, midday squares are different than Nash bars because midday squares are something where you have one and I need another. <laughs> and I probably could have a third and maybe even a fourth. Where Nash bars, it's like I have one and I'm semi-satiated enough from like a 300 calorie bar, like what you would expect. Whereas midday squares, I think that there's something in there that just has me craving more. They have me in a freaking chokehold. Yeah, I'm with you. So the midday squares are amazing, but just grab it and then really go. Like, don't <laughs> come back. <laughs> don't stand near the box at all. Yeah, those are those are my two favorites. Nugo bars, I've, I've moved them out of my rotation um, as of late, but I still love the Nugo bars. What's the flavor that we like? The chocolate pretzel sea salt. It's the only flavor that we buy, so I don't even look because it's the only one we have, yeah. you know? So I like that one. Um, other on-the-go snacks. I feel like most people are asking this with the goal of getting more protein in, would you say? Probably. So, I mean, I, I am a, was a big fan of, of beef jerky. Not to say that I'm not now. I just don't have it in my regiment at the moment. So beef jerky was also great. I'm also big on protein shakes because I think it's easy. It's easy digesting if you have one that is... Um, a grass-fed way that is going to have limited artificial sweeteners or no artificial sweeteners like the Whey Plus from Legion. And so that's always a great um, addition to have to the rotation as a whole. So those would be my four, I guess, four or five. What are your other just favorite snacks in general? Because I know you love your snacks on a day-to-day. Uh, you're you're going to be a better answer than that for me because I have, honestly, off the top of my head right now, I don't know the last time that I had a snack. I... <laughs> <laughs> this guy is the most dramatic guy yeah. in the whole entire world. I like, so here's the thing is that I'm dramatic by nature, <laughs> but I'm further dramatic because it makes my wife laugh. <laughs> and so then as soon as she starts laughing, I'm like, I can continue this. <laughs> I am um, seasoned enough in dramatic nature that I can keep this running and I can continue to, um, make it crazier and crazier. And so I do. And then she continues to laugh like this and I'm like, I'm doing great. This was my goal. I'll just continue to be dramatic. Oh my goodness. I will say, I love that you are dramatic, not only because it makes me laugh, but my parents could tell you that I am a dramatic person. So it helps me out that it's not just me being dramatic. You get to be dramatic too. I would be curious if, if um, as people meet us or they listen to the podcast, if they were to think that you were more dramatic or that I was more dramatic. Because in real life, people know Alex <laughs> Bush. <laughs> I was I was going to ask the viewers to answer that question, but now that Sue has exposed the wrong answer, we oh. all know. <laughs> Go ahead. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Let us know from what you know from us online or if you know us in person, who is the most dramatic? I vote Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Snacks for you. Uh, you love M&M's. This is not a quick and easy on the go snack. I mean, I guess I know, it is. I was actually. just branching off into just just having a solid a combo. handful. What's the what's your favorite M M&M and M in general? Oh, it's such a hard decision. I think I would say peanut. I go back and forth. I would say peanut or peanut butter is my two favorites. Have you tried a lot of the like the pretzel extra flavors? Almond. I feel like there's so many more than what we've tried. Oh really? I feel like there's I feel like I've only tried maybe six. Okay. There's like millions. Millions. <laughs> and millions. <laughs> there's a lot though. Okay. Well I've had the main six of almond, uh regular, peanut, peanut butter, pretzel. Pretzel. I thought I had a sixth. Is it like a dark chocolate one or something? There's dark chocolate. I, feel like I've tried I think that. there's a fudge, a caramel, a sugar cookie. Caramel would not hit for me. There's a lot. Okay. Well, you love M&Ms. You've in the past gone through Cheez-It or Goldfish phases. Mm. Not recently though. That's child Alex. I'm adult <laughs> Alex now. Uh, animal crackers, specifically 
Frosted no, animal crackers. No, don't do crackers. that to me. Frosted animal crackers also <laughs> have that crazy thing that midday squares have in them, and I cannot keep my hand out of the bag. Oh my god, they're so good. Frosted animal crackers, <laughs> so good. The sprinkles <laughs> add just a nice little touch of crunch. Oh, oh my, my goodness, they're so good. That and Kroger cookies. Kroger cookies, uh, Kroger chocolate chip cookies, most specifically. Um, I could have the entire dozen of those. Chick-fil-A chocolate chip cookies. We're way out of the on-the-go snacks here. Oh, I mean, we And straight transition. into desserts. I don't know. Um, Miguel has never had a Chick-fil-A chocolate chip cookie, and we have to change that. Well, he also called my normal Chick-fil-A order <laughs> super fat. So I would love to share with you guys what my Chick-fil-A order is. <laughs> well, first say what you ordered that he said like, oh, we're going all in. <laughs> and I was looking at it like, this is tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my Chick-fil-A order can be stout sometimes. <laughs> um, what did I get? You got the grilled nuggets and then you got the cool wrap. And I don't even think you ate all of the wrap because you know at the bottom no. of a wrap when it's like just all wrap, yeah. uh, I don't think you ate the bottom of that. And and then you had fries, yeah. but you didn't have a specialty drink. You just had water or like Diet Coke or something. Uh, I think that was it. So <clears throat> that sounds about right. And those wraps are not anything special. So normal Chick-fil-A order, not tracking. I'm just going into Chick-fil-A to enjoy a delicious meal and probably have a little bit of pain because I'm so full. <laughs> so <laughs> what I do there is that I will have a deluxe spicy chicken sandwich with, with pepper jack pepper cheese, jack cheese, a large fry, a 12 count of, if, if I'm trying to be a little cognizant, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have grilled nuggets, but if I'm not being cognizant at all, we're going 12 normal nuggets. And if we're going normal nuggets, I may even bump to 24 because I'll be super oh hungry. Gosh. I mean, hyper palatable. Oh I can inhale gosh. them. So I've got my, sh and then I have a diet lemonade, two chocolate chip cookies. And if we're getting it to go home, I'll have those chocolate chip cookies heated up with a scoop of vanilla ice cream at home. And that is the best possible Chick-fil-A order that you could have. <laughs> and also like 15 or 1600 calories in a sitting, probably more than that. We actually. should go through and have like, this is what I order when I'm paying attention to macros. <laughs> this is what I order when I literally do not when care. When I'm just being a savage and this <laughs> happens, you know? And I mean, the other day he ordered two full entrees when we went out to eat. I did. And Which is a commonality when we go out to eat sometimes. Basically ate them all. He, he surprises people so much. And especially since even when you weren't in the diet, you're still in incredible shape and people see your structure. It's really kind of you. Thank you. It's facts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they see your structure and you'll order and make it seem so normal to entrees. And they're like, um, for the table. And you're like, no, you can just even put them on the same plate. <laughs> and they're so confused like I was very of just what they surprised. should do. What did I order? I had a, it was a steak. A steak with fries and a burger with fries. No, no, no. It was a, it was a chicken sandwich. Okay, yes, on, give me a little bit more credit the... there. I don't want to be that big of a savage. <laughs> it was a chicken sandwich and a, maybe an eight ounce steak or something. Sure. And, uh, I would have eaten it all, but I was starting to sweat a little bit. <laughs> And I was like, I probably should pull back. Oh my goodness. You guys are getting the most honest version of myself today. I'm <laughs> feeling, I'm feeling in alignment. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and you know, I would say for this dieting phase, it it's of course been hard on you and I, just with the stress, what we talked about in the last podcast. But I would say it's been the hardest on my mom. <laughs> because <laughs> I had no idea where you're going with that. My mom loves to feed people and to host people so, so much. And if you know me, then you know where that comes from as well. And she loves making food for Alex, especially because he does have such a big appetite. She loves feeding him. She will text me and ask what he needs that week or <laughs> what dessert he wants. And she's just going to make it from scratch, just whatever he wants. And she has been beside herself this whole entire diet, wondering if Alex is okay, yeah. if he's being starved. And then they take it a step further and they think I'm the one controlling his food and making the decisions <laughs> because Alex will be like, hey, make sure I don't just eat 12 of your mom cookies <clears throat> while I'm there. And he'll take a cookie and I'll be like, did you have another one? Just trying to hold him accountable. You know, we've already talked about it, not trying to, you know, just take control of everything. And my parents will be like, 
oh, man, if she's watching you, you can just come over here and eat whatever you want. So I would say she's definitely having the hardest time. I would have had a much easier time putting on weight in like high school and college <laughs> if your mom was the one feeding oh, me all the time. Trust me, it was pretty easy to put on weight. Well, it's pretty easy now to put on weight <laughs> if I was to eat with her pretty consistently. So um, yeah, she's she's struggling through this. She's got three more weeks to push through. <laughs> I've continued to reassure her that it's it, we're getting towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that she'll have a big blowout breakfast or something <laughs> um, at the end of all this. Big breakfast. Yeah, she Multiple times I've been over there and she's like, do you want to take some food home for Alex? Does he need big breakfast? I'm like, no, he's good. There's a reason he's not coming over <laughs> for right this second. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Up next, can I go to cycle classes five times a week and see the progress that I want? Such a broad question. It is. See the progress that I want. Progress in what? Are you getting, I mean, it sounds like your focus is cycling. So if you're going to cycling five times a week, I am certain that you're going to get better at cycling. But if your goal is to achieve hypertrophy and add muscle tissue and um, improve your overall body composition, I'm going to say that you're probably not going to make the best progress. You may make some progress, but you got to keep in mind, let's say that you want to grow your glutes and you are training or you're cycling five times a week. How do you think that your glutes and your hamstrings and your, your quads are going to recover from those five cycling classes? Now, could you undulate the intensity of these cycling classes to make them a little bit more tolerable? Maybe you go hard on a Monday when your next lower body training session is on Wednesday and the Tuesday and Wednesday cycling class is super low intensity. You're, it's basically just a, a cardio session for you. You're not going through the paces of what the instructor is going through. You're just going through the motions basically and using it for cardio. Then at that point, you may be able to make greater progress. But if you're going balls to the wall, doing exactly what the instructor is saying five times a week, your legs are probably not recovering all that well for you to thereafter have any sort of reasonable volume within your lower body training to make progress in adding muscle tissue or improving overall body composition. And so I think that it's a matter of looking at things in a, a greater detail to specify your goals more. And if your priority is to add muscle tissue, I think you're gonna have to change what specifically you're doing because the priority of your time is showing that you're putting a lot of time into the cycling and that may not be where your eggs are, are best invested at this moment if your goal is different than being the best at cycling. I think that this year I've really learned of the different modalities of fitness and what they really help me achieve. And I know that whenever we've watched something like the Olympics, and I choose that just because you get to see so many different sports at once, you get to see the different body types that those sports are to be elite. And I've always found that extremely intriguing just to see, hey, all of these people are extremely elite at what they do, and they all have such different body types because that's the body type and the structure and composition that's needed to be elite at what that is. And of course, we're not all personally going to be in the Olympics, but being able to take a look and kind of mesh together what you enjoy doing with how you want to look. And because I was so focused on competing that I was really pushing in the gym, I was pushing my food, and I was seeing that muscle growth. And in this time away from or just since I finished my shows, I've still been training, but I haven't had the same intent. And I've really seen that on my physique. And I guess I thought, hey, since you're still training and since you have this foundation of training, then you're still going to see the same strides forward or similar strides forward. But really being able to see, hey, if I don't push my intensity in the gym, my physique might not look the way that I prefer it to or I might not be able to eat as much food because I'm not, and I don't wanna say burning as many calories, but that 
at the end of the day is technically what you are deciding between. And that's been really helpful for me just to figure out what that balance of those different forms of fitness are for me to have the most all-encompassing approach that really fits for my lifestyle and my enjoyment and desires. And I think that like, especially with it being summer, it's a time where more physical activity is common, I suppose, especially here in Ohio, uh, because it's like the only time that the weather is good enough to do so. So with that, we're balancing a, a greater degree of all the different modes of fitness right this moment. And I think that maybe us sharing how we go about it would be advantageous. So the yoga process for myself, I'll, I'll speak for me, is that um, how I structure it is that I have one hard yoga session a week that is going to challenge me and, and push me into maybe some different movements or, or into greater depths of different movement um, or poses, I should say. And so that's my Monday class. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, we record this on Tuesday, so I'm always coming off of that the, the night prior and it whoops me. It, it is a hard class that teachers the teacher is great. She's um, making it more challenging and, and a lot of static holds and, and complexities to the different classes. So that's awesome. But then my Thursday class is much more of a slow and restorative flow. Um, and it's not necessarily that the teacher is is making it that way. I'm taking it that way. Like she may go at a, at a faster pace, but I'm just going at my own rhythm and kind of running through that way. And then if I go again on Saturday, um, that Saturday or Sunday, both of those options are extremely restorative. And so I'm more so using it to contrast my training in which I am <clears throat> training um, with such intent and such a point of getting to such hard contractions and those different factors that um, by more so using it almost as just stretching and getting into a, a hold and having stability within single leg or single arm poses that I have in place. And so that's how I've balanced the, the two where I'm resistance training three to four times a week. I am doing yoga two to three times a week. And then now we're incorporating bike rides. Mm -hmm. Big bike people yeah, now. Yeah, big bike people, um, <laughs> which I don't know how we're going to necessarily balance that in uh, because it is it is so fresh. We're only like two weeks into being able to use them. And I'm also refiguring out how to ride a bike. <laughs> um, I don't think I had ridden a bike consistently since I was in elementary school, to be honest with you. Like, I don't remember the last time that I got on a bike, so I'm just going to kind of throw it in that category. And so the first week was, it's st <laughs> I, I still can't really take turns quite yet. Mm. I'm, I, don't, I don't really trust myself to turn the front wheel a whole lot. Um, and so, especially on the sidewalks where mm -hmm. it, you're like going straight and then you're having to veer off and there's not really like a churn for you to make. It's like, you know? <laughs> So with that, I'm a little nervous <laughs> and I know that if I get off the sidewalk and I have like the area where it's going into the grass, I'm falling off this bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If my tire gets stuck in there, I am not agile enough right at this moment to pull myself out of that situation. So, um, getting the bike rides in is going to be fun. I'm not sure how we're going to incorporate it yet though. And you also have your walks and your rucks in there too. Yeah. The, uh, the walks and the weighted vest rucks are, are a good piece to talk about as well. The rucks, I would say more challenging. The walks are not as beat up on me, I suppose. It depends on what pace we're going at. I feel like lately it, I only have this pocket of time to get my steps in. And so I've just been walking as fast as I possibly can within a lot of the walks. So then it's been something where I've been more tired, but uh, with the rucks more specifically, you just have to wear the vest, right? <laughs> like you just can't try to fidget with it and get it like too far in front of you or too far, like pushed on your back because then your shoulder blades are getting into weird positions. And then you're not really realizing that they're either weirdly protracted or weirdly retracted. And so then when you take it off, you're like, oh my gosh, something I've, I've pinched something. This is super tight, et cetera, et cetera. So have to be cognizant of that. 
I enjoy the ruck and I wish that I could do it more, but it really does hurt me (laughs) because of the straps and where they're at. So if any of you guys use some sort of weighted vest and you find it very comfortable, then slide into my DMs, please. Because I was searching and I saw one that I was like, ooh, the way that's distributed, that's going to be good. And then it was like eight pounds or 10 pounds. And I would like for it to be a little bit more than that if possible. She said that she wants it to look like a fisherman's jacket. She well, I found it one better. that looks more like a life jacket than a fisherman's jacket, which they're kind of similar. Just grow them traps. <laughs> Just got to get more jack, bro. I've been trying to work on not having my traps overtake movements. Well, so time to flip the switch. <laughs> But within movement, you're someone who uh, you thrive on movement. And sometimes that can be difficult when exercising is a stress on your body, even things like yoga, which can be very restorative. So how do you balance those? I know you just talked about your yoga classes, but that push and pull of all of that, do you do the exact same thing every week? Do you listen to your body? What does that flow overall with all that movement look like? I would say I listen to my body. I I think that for myself, it's something where I've gotten a lot of repetitions. So I can listen to my body a little bit better because I've gone through the experiences of making the right call and I've gone through the experiences of making the wrong call. And so now I just have a a better track record of making the right call. And so I, I think that it is somewhat intuitive. I've got my baseline things that I have to get done within my training and with my uh, my cardio. And then I've got kind of my base amount of yoga sessions that I want to have per week. And then as I implement these different things within the rucks and with the bike rides, I'm kind of sampling what I'm capable of and, and almost intentionally pushing myself past the boundary so I know where the boundary is. And then I kind of, okay, this is where I'm at now. This is how I can incorporate this, but I don't know that until I push past the boundary. And so that's kind of my trial and error. And I I try not to get too beat up over it. It's, It's one of those things that you don't know until you know. And so you might as well just keep trying and adding a little bit more, a little bit more until it sucks. And then you're going to be a little sore. You're probably going to have to miss maybe a training session or, or whatever, and take a little bit longer rest period, maybe incorporate some refeeds and just try to get yourself into a recovered state. And then now you've got the baseline. So it's, it's just a, a matter of, of testing and evaluating and going from there. I think my favorite part of that is you talking about figuring out and establishing where that limit is, because I feel oftentimes people don't want to push to where that line might be or even a little bit past it because they're scared that they might not be able to do it. But in my eyes, truly, that's the only way you can see what you're truly capable of is pushing past maybe what you think you're capable of and seeing, oh, I, I could handle this. I could take this on. And then maybe you push a little bit too far and it's like, oh, nope, I can't. And And it's all about being able to challenge yourself to even see what you can be capable of. I think it lends to my mindset of if I have a 1% chance, I'm probably going to do it. (laughs) I'm probably going to give it a chance. Like I I want to be that, you know? And so that's kind of my my mindset of if if I'm going to push and then I'm going to find that and then I'm just going to continue to be at that baseline until I feel more comfortable to push again. And then I'm going to push until I find that boundary and then just continue to go that route because it is a matter of overall like its own form of progressive overload, if you will, within Mm. these different forms of fitness. And so just continuing to push the boundaries when I feel ready to um, is very important. And and with yoga, that's one thing that it's kind of like I'm I'm making my I guess slowest strides now that I've been consistently going for six months. Like I'm kind of out of that newbie window or at least that initial newbie window of things and really having to take my time with going to the next thing or like trying to push those boundaries because they're a little bit bigger of leaps to make than what I was previously doing. For sure. And for myself, I even have to, when I go to those yoga classes, maybe I have the intention of getting a new position or a new hold. And then I recognize, hey, my body really just needs to sit in this. And it's difficult to get to that point where you can truly listen to your body. But once you get there, it's honestly the most rewarding feeling just to know this is what my body needs right now. And I want to give you massive flowers and props because I feel like this is the best balance that you've had with movement. And I know it's something that you've struggled with. And I would say that the times that you've moved the least in your life are the ones that you're least 
in tune with yourself of that alignment. And this just feels like you have such a good mix of things that are easily accessible to you, but also something like yoga, if you knew you weren't going to do it consistently if you're doing it at home. And I'm right there with you. It's very hard to do at home. So you also knew it was going to be great to leave the house and being able to have that consistent schedule. But then things like the bike rides and the rucks and the walks, those are all things that you can do nearby. And when you have those smaller pockets of time, and I'm just so proud of you for finding out what that balance is. And I love seeing you so excited about movement. And I know sometimes you have to watch that stress limit or when sleep is down regulated, that's when you can't move as much. And that's when things are really difficult for you. But I know like boxing is something that you're really interested in. And you didn't choose to put that on your plate right now because you knew that that would push you out of the recovery zone and that trainability that you could have in doing any of these other movements. And just want to give you massive flowers for being able to find that for yourself. I appreciate that. One of the other questions here is talking about what is a trait we have learned from each other. And I would say that this goes in line with that of something that has really allowed me to, I would say, become the person that I am today is your ultimate belief in self. And that rubs off. I We've talked about environment in general of how much that changes, but just being able to be around someone who has such incredible self-belief has shown me that I am so capable or I should just believe in myself so much. And I just wanted to thank you for having such incredible self-belief in yourself and also having such incredible belief in me to allow me to have that for myself and really truly believe that. And of course, I love the belief you have in me, but it's so incredible to feel it coming from within. I appreciate that. And I'm glad that uh, that's nice. That was nice to hear. (laughs) Um, The trait that comes to mind for you, I would say, is kindness. I would say that you are the most kind and caring person that I I know, the the people that um, are closest to you, that mean the most to you, they all know that. And that's because of how you treat them and how you show up for them on a a regular basis. And also why when those individuals that you care about the most, that things don't go how we would have liked them to or or relationships fizzle out for whatever reason, that those moments are hard on you. And they're so hard because you you care so much and you um, put so much into each person that you do care so much about. And so... Having that level of kindness and care and, and genuine concern for each person's well-being is something that I have learned quite abundantly from you and something that has enhanced my life abundantly uh, and enhanced the relationships that I have as well. So thank you. Well, thank you. I love hearing that too. <laughs> You're so kind and sweet. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Oh, goodness. It is summertime, and with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. Do you have any recommendations on hiring a fitness coach or budgeting for a coach? I do. I think that these are two separate questions, obviously. The recommendations that I would give if you're looking to hire someone is vet the person, like get to know the person, consume their content, ask questions to their current or previous clientele. If you're able to get on a a phone call with them, that is such a privilege. And and that is amazing that you have the opportunity to do that. Uh, If you have the opportunity to get on a call with their sales staff, that is also a great opportunity to learn more about the process. And don't feel compelled that you have to say yes to the first person you get on the phone with. Like this is your health and this is your well being. And you should feel very aligned with the person that you're going to be working with because it's a very intimate workspace. And in terms of like you're being very open and honest and vulnerable in that setting, and you should feel 100% comfortable going into that. And so take your time. Take your time and um, go with the option that is makes you a little uncomfortable in the sense of the commitment that it is. Not uncomfortable in the sense of 
this guy makes me feel uncomfortable. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> this gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. But the one that you're excited about and you're like, this is a this is a little out of my budget and this is a little uncomfortable for me to, to make this big of a leap, do that one. Because that's where you're gonna learn the most about yourself as well as getting the most out of the progress or out of the process itself. Because the person who gets the least out of coaching, and I swear to you, I have been doing this for far too long for this to not be true, is the person that picks a coach that is going to be on the lower end of their budget of money that you can see go and it it's it's there and it's gone it's not a big deal it's not even crossing your mind is the individual who's going to skip check-ins is the individual who is is going to be like ah it's not that big a deal i'll eat this way for today um and x like it just continues to cascade and then you go through this whole 12 week um, window or 24 week window and you don't make the progress, but you only did like 50% of the things that were asked of you. And you're upset that you didn't get the results that you wanted. Like you didn't even want to invest in yourself to start with. Why do you think that that investment into yourself would have, would have paid dividends over that six month period when at the beginning, you didn't even want to do it to begin with. And so I think that that's the, the biggest advice and, and budgeting wise, I think that looking at your excess spending is the quickest way to make this happen. Like outside of your non-negotiable things, the roof over your head, the food in your mouth, and any of like your, I guess your car payment, things of that nature, like get those off the list. And then where is your spending? Are you going to Starbucks every day? Are you going out to fancy dinners? Are you going out for drinks over the weekend multiple times, paying a hundred dollar, two hundred dollar tabs over the weekend? Like, figure out those small things, and then all of a sudden, you're going to realize, oh, I've got m more money available to me than I thought. Now, is my lifestyle going to change? Probably. Like, if you're going to cut out the extracurricular things to make the budget for you to work with a great coach, like, yeah, your lifestyle is going to change, but it's going to change in a way that is for the better because this is something that's a priority to you. If you're going to be spending the money on a coach, it should be a top priority for you. I don't understand why you would be paying for a coach if it wasn't a top priority. And this is going to allow for you to expedite the process of learning more about your body, having questions answered that you would be searching on the internet to find generalized answers for. And now you've got, okay, this is specific to you. This is specific feedback for how I'm ex or how I'm performing this exercise. This is specific feedback for how I should be eating myself with all things in consideration. Like this is such a great investment for you long-term. And that is the thing where from a budgeting standpoint, the value should be so abundantly clear to you that the budgeting is, is easy to do because it's like, this is going to enhance my life so much. I think another thing to ask when you are getting on calls or are looking at coaches is to see what the company's mission statement is or what their core values are, especially if maybe you're a little bit less familiar or you are vetting multiple coaching staffs or multiple different coaches to decide what is going to be the best fit. And asking questions, of course, I feel like that's a, a no-brainer. I don't need to add that in. But really being able to see, do I align with what they're trying to do here? and what they want to have happen and what they're putting their res resources towards, does that match up with what I want to achieve within this? And I think that that's also really telling if someone doesn't know what their mission statement is or doesn't know what their core values are, because then it's getting to a place of, hey, maybe they are unsure, maybe this could look different in the future, and I need to be able to make the best decision for me in this moment. That's fair. Right. Talking about training, does your training change over a diet phase, the volume or intensity or the phase of training? And what are your goals in training during this diet? <laughs> like six questions in one. Where do you want me to start? What was the first one? Does your training change over the diet phase? Yes. With that, they were asking if the volume, intensity, or the phase change, or maybe all three. <laughs> I Yes. So 
I'll, I'll put it all in one answer is that there is going to be change. There is going to be progression. There's going to be changes to volume allocation. There is going to be change to the training stimulus or emphasis that's being made um, within the phases. And so um, within that, this is going to be dependent on what the feedback is within the, the check-ins and how is the body uh, responding to the training itself? What are some of the biofeedback markers within recovery that are... Um, in place as, as well as, uh, as food gets lower, like your training volume is going to look a little bit different on the tail end of a dieting phase where you may be, let's say between 14 and 1500 calories of intake and doing X amount of cardio. And it, comparatively to someone who's eating 2,400 calories and hitting 8,000 steps a day, 10,000 steps a day. Like it's going to look different because you're able to recover from more. You've got more resources to be able to recover from more. But I think the thing that does not change is going to be the intensity and the intent that is taken to that volume that's there, whether it's more or it's less, the intensity is going to be the same. The, the focus is going to be the same. Within dieting phases, people often bring down the intensity. And to some degree, you might have to bring the volume down or have extra rest for the exact reasons that you stated. But I find that people stop challenging themselves as much in the gym. And that's where even if you've worked and challenged yourself outside of that dieting phase and you've put on quality muscle, now that you're in a deficit, if you have less intensity and as you're losing weight, you could lose some of that muscle along with fat or just end up with a more skinny fat look of, hey, I did diet, but I don't have the muscle that I thought I had. And that can come from really not pushing that intensity even when you are in a deficit. But I will also add that like, if you're just going in and cranking away at the most volume humanly possible and you're just going until you don't feel like you could lift your arms anymore, or your legs or whatever the situation is, that's also a detriment. You're probably like ripping some of that tissue away as your body is, is not going to be like, all right, Susie, I know you want to have a bubble butt at the end of this fat loss phase. So I'm going to make sure that we don't pull any of your body uh, or any of your muscle tissue off of you. I know that this is important to you. No, no, no. It's going to use the resources that are available to it. And so if you have stripped your body and, and been in a super inflamed state and not giving yourself enough recovery time, you are certainly putting yourself in a situation where you're going to lose muscle tissue. Like if you're not recovering from session to session and you're going into every cardio session and every training session still sore from the time before and the time before that, you're not going to be in a great spot at the end of the prep itself or the uh, diet phase as a whole with the amount of muscle tissue that you worked so hard to build prior. And so that's something to keep in mind as you're going through and probably a sign that you need to change some of your training as you get deeper into the deficit as a whole. So if someone's going into a diet or in a diet, what should their goals be or should they have specific training goals? Because I know when people leave a diet, oftentimes I'll talk to them of, hey, we have to have goals outside of just the scale. And that might be hitting a certain weight or a PR within the gym. So what does that look like for, let's talk you specifically for goals you have within training? So there is research out there that with muscle building or hypertrophy, that if protein is equated, we can still see muscle gain in a calorie deficit. And so that one piece of literature, or uh, there may be multiple studies that show this, is enough for me to be like, if I still train hard, I may be able to put on some tissue. <laughs> it is it is enough of a reason for me of like, this is, is proof, I can make it happen. It kind of goes back to that same mindset I was talking about. If there's a 1% chance that it can happen, I'm gonna stay consistent enough to make sure that I'm part of the 1%. And so my biggest thing within training right this moment is just maintaining my overall strength, comparing the logbook, uh, making sure that when I was at this rep range previously, where was I at weight wise? Um, as well as am I paying close attention to my recoverability? Like, am, am I pushing myself well past the boundary of what I can recover from? through those training sessions? If so, I need to vocalize it to my coach. I need to have conversations with them of, hey, this is where I'm at and I feel like I'm not having adequate recovery. Can Do we think we want to back off and, and so on and so forth? Um, so having those conversations, but that would be the, the main focus for me is still just training hard and maybe put on a little bit more tissue. 
I'm right there with you. And I actually just started a new training phase today, and it was super fun to get after. And I know it can be difficult to have that conversation with a coach of saying, hey, this might be a little bit too much volume, especially because you probably hired someone who knows more than you. And so you want to just go with what they have told you to do. And I found a few phases ago that there was one or two sessions in all of it that I was like, I think I'm having a hard time recovering from it. And it was really helpful information for you to have. You were able to look at some videos of me training. And because we you know, live together, you're able to see me training, see what that looked like for recovery, and then make the best call. So it is really great to have that communication and just to be able to have a conversation with your coach. Well, also, it stems from like, in terms of my coaching experience, I've worked with Adam for three years. Like he knows how hard I train. He knows you know, where I'm at. So he's got a lot of data to go off of. If it is something where I bring to him of, hey, I don't feel like I'm recovering from this. He's got reason to believe of like, yeah, that probably makes sense. I pushed you a little bit far on these boundaries. And the same thing goes for me coaching you mm -hmm. is that that rapport is there. If it's your first phase working with yeah. a coach, like, <laughs> and you don't, and you haven't seen any training videos, the likelihood that I'm like, if you're coming to me and it's your second week in the phase and you've sent zero videos and you have no videos to show me, like, I'm not going to be like, you just need to keep training mm -hmm. and give me some videos. Show me, show me how hard it is. Like, I want to see it because if I don't have that, then we're just, we're just talking. Like we're just having conversation. It's not really anything actually happening. <laughs> And the last question here, which I think is a perfect question to end on, especially in light of our conversation earlier in this podcast, is if you are still hungry after you've finished your macros, what do you do? Should you eat more? Should you just tell yourself you're not hungry and move on? What do you do in those situations? I'll preface with this is not easy. I, I think that each time that a, a coach or, or someone in the fitness space is asked a question like this, they come with a solution. And so then the viewer is in this place of, well, since they have the solution, it's easy for them. And I will tell you right now, it is not easy. And you talk, we talked about me being dramatic. This is when I get the most dramatic is when my food's done and I'm still hungry. And uh, <laughs> I ride that out in the evening, you know? And so the thing for me is that I try to take a step back and ask myself of, is it more important to me to feel satiated right now or is the goal that I have of losing body fat more important to me? And are there moments where I just go ahead and eat a little bit over my macros? Yeah, that happens, but it's very few and far between because more often than not, my answer to that exact question is that the fat loss is more important to me. Having this goal in place, something that I have put my word to and is important to me is, the, is much more important than me being a little hungry in that setting. And I also try to keep in mind of how much of a privilege it is to even have that conversation with myself of I, I can eat whatever I want and uh, I'm choosing to eat less. And so it's, it's not something that I should complain a whole lot about because it's my decision to begin with. And two, it is something that not everyone has the opportunity to do. And so I try to keep those two things in mind the most. And generally that allows for me to get into a better headspace to um, make the decision. Dieting doesn't have to be miserable, but it also isn't going to be extremely comfortable the whole entire time. And I think recognizing that and realizing the privilege that you have to purposely restrict calories is the main way that I get through and I frame my mindset on those times where it's like, I wish I could eat more or I am hungry, but all of my macros are finished up. Another side of that is I often take a little self-audit and I think, did I maybe get some more movement today and that's why I'm more hungry? Or did I distribute my meals in a way that was not beneficial to me and front-loaded or back-loaded my food, however you want to say it? Maybe I got up earlier and so I'm more hungry in the evening or I didn't have enough water. I take inventory of all those different factors so I can see, was it something that maybe I can make a better decision tomorrow with the same? amount of food and feel better? 
Or is it just the aspect of I am hungry because I am dieting? And that is always so incredibly helpful for me because I'm not only taking some responsibility for myself, but I'm able to see if it wasn't just one way to it. And I think that people sometimes get afraid of being hungry in the evening. And that's where a lot of macro hoarding comes into place, where they save back their food so they can have a ton in the evening so they don't get hungry. But how I look at it is what is the worst case scenario? That I'm hungry for one night and then I change the structure or the layout the next day and I'm a little bit less hungry and I get it figured out or that I am very uncomfortable because I ate way too much in one sitting. I didn't have the energy to do the things I wanted to do throughout the day because I wasn't eating enough food and now I'm going to sleep and I feel like I haven't digested my food and I could have poor sleep or poor digestion because of that. And really just being able to have those honest conversations with yourself and understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because no one's making you diet. No one ever is making you diet. So you get to make the decision if it is a priority to you or not. And how we're doing it within this dieting phase is it's a priority for these 12 weeks. And so it's even easier to dial in because, hey, it's 12 weeks. And that's, in the grand scheme of things, not that much time. And if I can commit myself to this and show myself how mentally strong I am and how capable I am, then you know what? the rest of the year and or the rest of my life, I'm able to eat what I want in those situations. Now, by me saying eat what I want, that might also mean that my physique or my body composition might change. But if we're really talking about what you can or what you should do or anything like that, you get to then make the decision for yourself about your life. And there needs to be responsibility taken for that and ownership for what role you play and what your goals are, if you even know what those goals are. Amen. Amen. Do you have any other questions you want to throw in or anything to wrap up? No, I'm I'm ready to eat. Um, I need to get my lunch in. I am very hungry. If you are still watching this, you need to be subscribed to the YouTube channel. Or if you're listening to this on your favorite listening platform, um, you need to be subscribed as well. We appreciate you all. Thank you for listening today. We'll catch you in the next episode.